Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much, Minister Farhan. It's a great honor uh, to be in your presence and have this interview. Um, my first question is, why is this a prompt time to be in Iran, a person of your stature and uh, position? Why is this the correct time to be in Iran for a visit? Hmm. That's a very good question. Our national convention starts this week, Thursday, in Chicago. I never leave the country before my national convention. This year, however, it is imperative that I come. I don't think I understood exactly why until I got here. I realize how close the Islamic revolution in Iran is to the nation of Islam in America and our desire to literally build a real nation of Muslims. We have suffered under white America now 461 years. And we have found the, the civilization and its people disagreeable to live with in peace. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our teacher, taught us that Allah taught him that this is the time in history for the separation of black people in America, indigenous people from the whites of that nation. And coming to Iran at this time enabled me to see how valuable a treasure the Islamic revolution and the knowledge that is present in Iran is to our aim to build a nation. Every discipline that we need is right here. All the scholars and scientists that we need to help us to develop an Islamic nation is right here. So I found that the name Shabazz, which has been with us in the nation of Islam so long, is a Persian name. We found that the mother of Master Fard Muhammad, the one who is the founder of the nation of Islam, her name was Babiji. And that is um, from uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, yes. Azerbaijan. And I have a strange name. Farrakhan. And when my teacher named me Farrakhan, I wondered, I never had heard it before, so I wondered what did it mean? And he answered me very wisely. He said it has very many good meanings. It's one of the modern names of Allah. He said I have the meanings upstairs and I will give you the meaning at another time. That another time never came. So here I am in Iran and they show me somebody, a, a great, um, uh, I think, a designer, clothes designer. She's Farah Khan. Then there, this is a name. When the brothers came into the airport and the bag with books opened up 
And one of the books said, Defending Farrakhan. So the man said, Defending Farrakhan? Farrakhan, that's a Persian name. So I said, wow. <laughs> I'm tied to Persia. And I, I like the name Persia for some reason better than Iran, but the Persian is a great civilization, an ancient civilization, a very rich culture. So being here at this time has shown me why the nation of Islam in America should tie with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you, sir. 20 years ago, um, on the 22nd of Bahman, the anniversary, you had an opportunity to speak to the people of Iran during the anniversary demonstration, uh, which was very significant. And we'll be showing an, uh, a clip in the program from that. Do you recall that and what you said at that time? Well, you know, uh, I had never walked in a parade and hearing everybody around me saying, Bakva, Israel, Bakva, America. Uh, what is that? Death to America, death to Israel. So I felt a little strange, you know. So when I got up, to speak, uh, and I thank uh, President Rafsanjani, who gave me that honor. And I understand that's the first time that somebody from outside of Iran had the privilege of speaking on that day on the same page, on the same stage, pardon me, with uh, the president. And the words that come to mind is, your problem is not America. Your problem is not Israel. The problem of the Islamic world is our deviation from the Sunnah of the Prophet and from the Holy Quran. And we have gotten so far away from what the Prophet actually taught and the example that he gave that we need a guide now because we've lost our way. Enter Imam Mahdi. So we in America believe in the Mahdi. We believe and love the Mahdi. We believe that the Mahdi is the answer to all of the needs of the human family because when he comes, he sets down every tyrant. He sets justice in the earth. And the thing that struck me, he breaks the cross and he kills the swine. Well, I can't picture uh, the great uh, Mahdi going around breaking crosses. But when you have a cross, you have an upright and a horizontal which represents the two natures of the human being. Abraham was an upright man. So the nature of God in us is that we walk physically upright, but spiritually we should also live upright. But there's a, um, a struggle between the upright nature of God in us and the horizontal nature of God, which lowers the human being to the level that the human being has been lowered today, to the level of the four-legged animals, the beasts of the field, or even the reptiles that crawl on their bellies. This is the way human beings are today. So breaking the cross means destroying in the human being the weakness of the flesh and making the flesh to bow down to the mind of uprightness rooted in truth and justice. And then killing the swine. 
living in America, I turn on my television, I hear the foulest language, the most decadent speech and pictures of naked women and men performing devious acts on national TV. So the American people have become like swine, an appetite for filth. So breaking the cross and killing the swine, to me, is killing the nature in man to devour filth. We want no more of filthy language, filthy songs, filthy dances, filthy dress of the women unclad. We want no more filth. We want to clean up so that we can be welcomed in any civilized society. That's what I remember. I didn't get in that deep, but that's what I think I remember saying. Yes. You're a, a unique voice in America uh, behind an organized group, a disciplined group, a group that has a spiritual aim and uh, has been changing and growing also. One of those major happenings was the Million Man March that occurred 20 years ago. And um, it is a, a little bit scary, I think, for the system. Uh, I think the way that media approaches, the mainstream media uh, sort of teeters uh, and try to, but doesn't touch it. And more and more, and every year we see that it's more and more untouchable in the mainstream media. What is it in the Million Man March that is scary for the mainstream media? Your own words this past time? And what do you think is in the future of your movement in general? When you are an oppressor, one of the things that you fear is the unity of the oppressed. Because once the oppressed find the path to unity and have had enough of oppression, their unity and their desire to be free, justified, and equal brings them against that tyrannical force. And the history and nature teaches us that there is no power that can stop a human being who wants to be free. And so when they see our unity, they see the end of their rule over us, and that's what terrifies them. And that is what terrifies Satan. If you remember in the Quran, Satan and Allah were having a conversation. And that's very interesting that God and Satan should dialogue. And Satan says to Allah, respite me till the day when they are raised. Raised how? The masses of the people are in a state of slumber or death or sleep. And so Satan can rule the people as long as they are in a state of death or sleep. So the Satan is saying to God, respite me, delay my doom until the day when they are raised in consciousness. The word in consciousness is not there, but the people that are raised in consciousness are not going back to sleep. That means Satan's time is absolutely up. And so Satan says to God, because you have caused me to remain disappointed and judged me as erring, I am going to lie in wait for them in your straight path. And I'll come after them from before them, from behind them, from their left side and from their right side. And I will make 
all of them deviate. And Allah says, whosoever follows you, I will certainly fill hell with you all. Now just look at our religion, Islam. Look at Christianity. Look at Judaism. Look at Buddhism. Look at anyone that says my religion is from God and study their actions. Satan has already taken control of Islam. Satan is in control of Christianity, of Buddhism. So right in our religion, the enemy has come. And now look at the division of Muslims. The Shia on one side, the Sunni on the other. Nations gathering on the Sunni side and nations gathering on the Shia side. And what is between the two now is a toxicity of language and actions that produce hatred between two brothers. So all it needs now is for the enemy to start a, a match or a little conflagration and it could lead to a civil war, a religious war between Muslims and thus Satan wins. But Allah says in the Quran, they plan and Allah plans, and he is the best of planners. But I humbly say to this beautiful audience, Allah says in the Quran, hold fast to the rope of Allah and be not divided. We're not listening to Allah. It says, and you were on the brink of a pit of fire. And Allah saved you from it. He united your hearts and you became brethren while before you were enemies. And that is the condition of our Islam today. That's the condition of Christianity. That's the condition of religion. And that says Satan has fulfilled his word. And Allah says in another part of the Quran, you will only get, you will not get my purified ones. And those of us whom Allah purifies from the dross of the fall of Islam, the fall of this world into evil and decadence, we might make it out of this. A great war is coming, and if we can't find the path of unity, this Middle East is going to go up in the fire of death and destruction because this area is the trigger for the great war that the prophets predicted that every nation would be involved with. So I pray that Islam and Christianity and Judaism and all of the religions that are at, uh, in, become enemies of each other, I pray that we will stop, put the guns down and sit down like followers of the prophet and bring his sunnah and this Quran in the center and let's reason together and find the path to peace. Um, you know, America has, because you, you've been around, mashallah, for a good time, you've seen America change. America in 1975 was not the same America it is today. Values have uh, degraded to the point that somebody of your generation, um, somebody of my generation who has witnessed things uh, are surprised at how quickly um, values collapsed in America beginning in the 80s onwards. How foreign do you feel yourself in your own country? Well, we have to understand that we're living at the time of the fall of America. She's losing her power, her prestige, her influence, 
She's in a state of moral and intellectual decline. The whole idea of white supremacy has run its course and it is now on its deathbed. Well, when you see a civilization going down, it's like a major ship <laughs> that is sinking and you don't want to get caught in the pool of a sinking ship. So it's time now, as the Bible says, and the Quran, it, I think the Quran says, set your face for religion, being upright, the nature made by Allah in which he has created man. Before they come from Allah, that which cannot be averted, and on that day they shall be separated. So the righteous are going to have to be separated from those that love wickedness. And so I, I'm, at, I'm at home among the filth of America because my people are there in the mud. The other day, they took me to the helicopter to have a beautiful ride over to where the uh, president was speaking. And as I was going toward the helicopter, I stepped in some mud. And um, as I stepped up on the uh, uh, helicopter, my feet slipped a little on the uh, stairs going up because the bottom of my shoe was completely muddy. And as I sat there waiting for the helicopter to take off, the brothers took my shoes off and began to clean the mud. Well, my people, the black people of America, are in the mud of civilization. My job from Elijah Muhammad is to transform their lives. So I can't transform their lives from a television studio or um, from a distance, I've got to get my foot in the mud to get my people up out of the mud. And so I'm, I'm at home in America in spite of her filth because our people are there, our mission is there, and we cannot leave them in their condition. We have to work with them until they, like we, experience the transformative power of Islam. <clears throat> Minister Farrakhan, the Afro-American minority in America is a powerful minority because they're the only ones that when they resist, somehow the cities end up in martial law. And suddenly you see Ferguson with tanks, with armored vehicles, with men uh, arms to the hilt, uh, something that we, we did not witness two or three decades ago. How is it, how, and we remember Los Angeles, let's, let's say 25 years ago, but as we are proceeding in time, this is becoming more and more serious. The white supremacist is becoming more and more ruthless. It's not learning its lessons. It kills uh, easily. And the resistance is there, and the martial law is instituted. I remember we, we've been having uh, New Horizon conferences in Iran in which different groups of Americans have come and visited our country, many of them patriotic Americans, and the last group was Afro-Americans. Every group that came to Iran and went back was harassed at the border when they entered the America. Sometimes they were detained from three hours up to 18 hours. Dr. Finkelstein was detained for 18 hours. But when the Afro-Americans went back, they didn't even ask him a question, as if something was different here. Now, I, as somebody who witnessed that conference, and I've been witnessing the news, uh, I have a question I would like to ask Minister Farah Khan. What, what is it that uh, they're so careful what is it that they're watching out for? Because I know they're watching it. It's a 
concentrated decision that was made. We had 25 guests who went back, and this time, for the first time, no one was detained at customs. They weren't even asked a deviant question, or where were you, what were you doing there? Well, um, Pharaoh, when the children of Israel were in Egypt under his tyrannical rule, Pharaoh feared a couple of things that he called a conspiracy to um, get rid of this that he feared. The words that are in the Bible read like this, Pharaoh speaking, come. Let us, in words, take counsel together. Here's a problem. The children of Israel are multiplying. So we have to deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and join on to an enemy of ours and come against us. The fear of the government of the United States of America with blacks like Paul Robeson leaving America and being accepted in Russia. He learned to speak Russian. He was a great celebrity in Russia. When he got back to America, he was vilified. His passport was taken, W.E.B. Du Bois, his passport was taken. Martin Luther King even was censured uh, after he came back to the United States from Africa. Well, now this military, militarization of the police is because America expects something. I was very concerned when a black man was made president and the hatred of many white supremacists against Barack, I thought, oh my, they must think that he's going to be assassinated. And as a hundred cities were caught on fire when Martin Luther King was assassinated, if they ever assassinated Barack Obama, it would create revolution. So I watched, and so far it looks like he might get out in this next 10 months. But here's the dynamic. Since um, uh, Barack Obama became president, you have over a thousand militias in America made up of white people. White people with heavy armament that are angry with their government. And you know right now the, the Congress is at 11% of people satisfied with it. That means 89% are dissatisfied with Congress. The president's rate probably in the 40s and the Supreme Court down. The people are dissatisfied and white people are not like us. We get angry and we might march a little, raise a little hell and then go back to sleep. So they don't worry too much about us, but white people, Coming over here, you went to Iran, for what? You can't tell them that they're just innocent people coming to look at a revolutionary society and that society has not affected them positively. So all of these militias that are well armed, black people have the right as citizens to buy a weapon but how many black people legally 
have access to weapons. The weapons that are in the black community are illegal among the youth. And they don't really know how to shoot. They can't go to the gun range and learn because they're not legally um, carrying weapons. But white people, you got over 300 and 15 or 20 million Americans, and you got almost 350 million guns among the American people. So the American people are armed to the teeth, angry, upset. So here's the Bible prophecy. Since you love talking to white people in America, since you love the shedding of blood, I am going to give you your own blood to drink and you will be drunk with your own blood as with sweet wine. Now you go back and look at Waco, Texas and, and look at recently in Washington armed revolt among whites. They're not playing. And so they are ready to shoot and the government will be forced to shoot them. And I sit back and I look at Mrs. Clinton and the group saying to Barack, if we don't stop Gaddafi, he's going to slaughter his own people as if you care. But you wanted Gaddafi out of the way. Oh, he killed his own people. You started a civil war in Syria. Anytime there's a civil war, there's the killing of your own people. America's meddling in the Middle East, meddling in the affairs of other nations, creates a civil war condition. Well, she never thought that that was going to come home to her. So remember the principle of justice. You can't sow corn and reap potatoes. You get back what you put in. America has done evil, not the American people. I'm talking about wicked policies of a government run amok. And now those chickens, as Brother Malcolm said once, are coming home to roost. So America, get your guns ready. Because you don't have to deal with us. Because we don't have any weapons. You're going to have to deal with your angry citizens. And then somebody else is going to say, look at America. She's killing her own people. <laughs> so, oh, it's, you know, justice is a beautiful thing. You know, when, when you look at the principle, what is just for the oppressed is not the same justice for the oppressor. The oppressor must reap what they have sown and the oppressed get mercy from God and deliverance from their condition. Sorry for that run-on sentence, brother. But <clears throat> so you think that um, we are approaching a moment in history that some believe is very different than previous moments. Uh, it's a sort of a climax. I mean, when you even look at the prospects of an election, uh, you have characters that you never had seen before that almost looked like caricatures uh, compared to what you had three decades ago, four decades ago. They don't even look like politicians anymore. Um, what signs are there? I mean, what, what, what are these signs and what, what, how are you alarmed about what you have to do as a leader of the Afro-American community to be able to survive this tumult? Separation is the best answer. America is on a downward trajectory. And some of those that I've been watching who want to be president will hasten the trajectory downward 
when you listen to their speeches, their so-called desires for America. But the black man, he has to taste some of the punishment because every great leader that we've ever had, we never followed them well. We cheered them, and when they were gone, we went right back to sleep. So we're headed for a divine whipping. But America is headed for divine destruction. So when I go back, God willing, I have to point out to America her only way out of what's come upon her. And then it's up to her to do with me what she pleases and to do with what we say. But the calamities are increasing daily. Allah is whipping America with the forces of nature. And America can escape it, but there's something America has to do, and it starts with the word repentance. And if America will not repent, and I doubt that she will, because she's so arrogant over her perceived power, she thinks she can make the whole world afraid of her, and most of the world is afraid of her. But today, ask North Korea, are you afraid of America? Ask China, how about you? Ask ISIL. America's talking about there's just 30,000 of them, and you gotta get the whole Western world together to fight ISIL? What happened to you? You can't go it alone no more. Suck your brothers in to your demise. Yes, we're in a, a great and a dreadful day right now. America can escape it. It's a very narrow window. But we will present to America that narrow window and see what she will do. She's at the end. I cannot finish my questions without remembering two great passionate characters that have affected history. Two great Afro-Americans, Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Two passionate, emotional, aware, conscious individuals who we are still witnessing the ripples of their consciousness. How much are they missed today? Well, to be very honest, white America has put Dr. King to sleep. He would be greatly missed if black people understood that Martin Luther King was more than a dreamer. He was a revolutionary thinker. And in the last years of his life, if you study his words and his desires for action, you will see that Dr. King had awakened from the dream. In fact, he said it himself, that his dream had become a nightmare. Yes, he's missed. Malcolm, he was my mentor. I grew up in Islam under Brother Malcolm. The greatest pain that I had as a Muslim and a student of his that loved him so much that I would have given my life to save his life. But he went against his teacher. And unfortunately, we lost Brother Malcolm. But you know, you can't kill truth. You can kill the flesh that spoke the truth, but the truth, as one writer said, truth crushed 
to the earth will rise again. Malcolm is alive. Martin is alive. And they're alive in me. Malcolm was 39 when he was killed. Martin was 39. They were on an, L, um, an evolutionary trajectory. And their words at the end spoke of where they wanted to go. They died before they could get there. But I'm alive now. I've lived twice the age of Dr. King, twice the age of Brother Malcolm, and now I'm in the position by the grace of God to complete the revolution that they started. And I believe I will live to do that. I believe that Allah will allow me to live and Dr. King will live again because Farrakhan is bringing him back to the consciousness of the people. Malcolm never died. They just twisted Malcolm. Malcolm would rise up from the grave and fight somebody to think that he is on a U.S. government stamp. He never was a friend of the U.S. government. So to be on a stamp like he's some friend of this, this wicked uh, enterprise that used a counterintelligence program to stop a black messiah from rising among us, they failed. The government failed. Malcolm is alive. Martin is alive. Dubois is alive. Garvey is alive. Nat Turn is alive. Denmark Vesey is alive. All of our ancestors that gave their lives for our liberation, they're alive in the generation that is here now. And so we all will be in the pantheon of history because their great contributions will be fulfilled in the youth that are on scene today. My last, very last question is, uh, these are the last hours you're in Tehran right now, and you had an interesting uh, meeting with Ayatollah Jannati. I, because he's an important man and he's controversial, uh, I'd like to ask He's you, controversial. He is controversial because he, he, he is at an old age and very, very active, very, very young in, in thinking. He is many times on Friday prayer podium and uh, uh, his son is the Minister of Culture. Uh, but most important of all, he's very youthful at an old age. Oh. That he walked with you down to the bus. Uh, yes, sir. Uh. Oh, we were so impressed with him. Uh, my goodness, I didn't know he was controversial, but gee, I'm in good company. <laughs> <laughs> he was so young. He was so brilliant. He was so effervescent. And like a father, he counseled us beautifully, beautifully. And in the end, he gave me this magnificent Quran, but he spanked me a little, you know. As elders always have that right. When you are among your elders, I'm in my 80s. I think he's in his 90s, you know. So that's my elder, and I had to be respectful even when he was giving me my nice spanking. <laughs> But, but he said, Farrakhan, do you speak Arabic? I said, no, I don't speak Arabic. And a little frown came over his face, and he said, well, the Quran is in Arabic. All of the writings of the great scholars are in Arabic, so you must learn to speak Arabic. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then I said to him, you know, your, your highness, in the Quran it says, Allah never sends a messenger to a people, but that he speaks the language of the people. The people that I'm talking to in America don't speak any language other than English, 
and they speak that not too well. But I understood his point, but I couldn't go to my people like some do and start off with this great Arabic uh, opening of their lecture. And our people are sitting there looking at them like a cow in the field looks at you and you're talking to the cow and the, you think the cow understands you and the cow says, moo. <laughs> the people don't, <laughs> they don't understand. So why not, if we are trying to communicate to a people, speak to them in the language that they know and then introduce to them the beauty of Arabic. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people in America God has blessed me to convert to Islam without giving them Arabic. I gave them English and they came to worship Allah. Now they're studying Arabic. But I promised his eminence that, uh, oh, when I come back again, sir, I'm going to show you that I've been obedient and I'm going to get busy trying to learn Arabic. It was the most beautiful expression of love. I felt like I was in the presence of divinity. I felt like this was the crowning achievement of our visit was to have 40 minutes with His Highness, the Grand Ayatollah Janati. And then, you know, he autographed this Quran for me I kissed him on his forehead and he reached for me to kiss him on his lips and we kissed each other. He held my hand and walked with me. And he, I started walking fast because I thought he was going to stay behind and when I looked, he was walking right behind me, so I stopped. And when we got to the door, Brother um, Bahmani. Bahmani said, he's going to walk you to your car. And there was this so-called elderly man walking. And then we went down in the elevator and we had to climb the stairs. I climbed in front of him a little gingerly because my legs now are showing signs of weakness. But I looked back and he just came right up the stairs. I said, just as energetic and spry. And he walked me to my car. And Brother Bahmani said, he has never done that before. So we were greatly honored and uh, we hope to learn much from the scholarship that is in Iran to help us build a nation of righteousness in the midst of this decadence and we are seeking reparatory justice from our government in that we are asking for what Dr. King was demanded when he was shot dead, land that we can become independent and build a society for ourselves. My dear, dear brother Talib, I want to personally thank you. Thank you and your dear wife, Sister Zainab, 
for allowing me this privilege to be interviewed by you. Brother Akbar was going to tell me some of the questions you wanted to ask. I said, don't tell me because I don't like a heads up on nothing. I want to see how Allah will use me when I don't know what you're going to ask me. And the moment you ask me, the answers start forming. May Allah continue to bless you, a great soldier of Allah that is a victim like Bahmani of the gas, mustard gas. He fought. Did you fight in the war again? Yeah. You're a great soldier. And I'm honored to shake your hand you, and to be interviewed Thank you, sir. by you. Thank you, sir. May honor. Allah bless you. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the interview. Inshallah, Allah bless you. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.